um, let to uh, welcome Maha, who is from the uh, American University in Cairo. She um, has done a lot of work on Christian literature, um, and she also teaches uh, courses on Christian literature. That's what she'll also be sharing with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Oh, you wanted the picture? You wanted to come back? <laughs> come back, come back. Come back. <laughs> I'm disappointed. <laughs> can only do it later, but it's okay. Who wants to tweet it out right now, maybe? <laughs> okay, thank you all for coming, and thank you to our virtual friends who are also with us. I'm going to have to stay here. I don't like to stay in one place, but just for the camera, the sound and everything, because the sound is picking up from the laptop. Um, I'm here to talk to you about this, uh, but I'd like to also listen to you, and I'd like us to have a conversation. Um, and, you know, if Virtual folks can't hear, I'll relay what you said to them and, and back. Um, so this presentation is actually based on, the seminar is based on an article that I just published recently uh, about reimagining digital literacies from a feminist perspective in my post-colonial context, which is based around the way I teach my own course. Um, and that article is available online, so the details of it are there. And the slides that I'm using for today are over here. They're open for commenting. So if you want to go back to them later, if you want to follow the resources. And today I'll talk a little bit about who I am because it influences a lot why I do what I do, why I teach why I, the way I teach. I'll do a sample activity from my course with you, which I think represents a lot of the way I think about my teaching. Um, and then I'll talk about how my understanding of different approaches to critical thinking, which was my PhD research, influences how I teach digital literacies right now from this feminist approach. And then I'll do another sample activity, hopefully if you have enough time, and talk a little bit more about why I do what I do again, and we'll have a discussion. If you want to interrupt me at any point to ask anything, I don't mind doing that, so please do that. Um, I just wanted to say one of the things that I think about as a teacher is that I bring my whole self to my teaching um, and to any context, even like now. So I like to show all these different dimensions of myself, and I wanted to know from the folks here, I am a teacher. How many of you teach? Okay. And I'm an educator, which you can do even if you don't teach, right? If you're a learning designer, so how many of you are educators? Because I'm my main job is a faculty developer. I have other people who teach. Um, I do research. How many of you do research? So some of us do just research, some do just teach, some do both. Um, I'm a faculty developer, so I am like a learning designer type of thing. I vlog, how many of you vlog or write in some capacity, other than just okay, I'm trying a little bit. Um, and I'm a tweeter, I use Twitter a lot. I'm a mother, how many people are parents? Yeah, so that influences my teaching a lot, right? How I think about it changes as my daughter grows. Um, and what else is in here? I'm an ed tech person, not really my favorite title for myself, but it's true, so. <laughs> and then um, I'm a warrior. I forget to worry about people a lot. <laughs> and I'm a lifelong learner. Hopefully that's everybody. You want to know plenty to learn forever? <laughs> Are you guys undergraduates? Okay. Hopefully you'll decide when you finish that you don't want to finish with afterwards. But I know that sort of feeling like I'm done, right? <laughs> okay. Um, and virtual folks, I hope you're doing that with each other. Hi, Liana. I hope you guys are doing that with each other, even though I can't see what you're writing. All right, and also, it's just so you don't have to worry, the links to everything are on these slides, so you can look at them here. <coughs> so most of the stuff I'm citing is stuff that I've worked on myself, and if it's someone else's work, I'll be citing it on the slide. Okay, so this activity is what I want to start with. Um, it's a video, it's a very short video, that I want you to watch and we'll have a discussion. <laughs> Can you hear? It's really something special that all these people traveling to and from all parts of the country, all parts of the country. Okay. All right. So I'll turn that off. Can I have some reactions to that? So what, what you were seeing was Donald Trump saying this tremendous sea of love. And what was he looking at? Being in the White House. What was that picture? 
What's your first reaction when you see this video? What does it make you think about? Confused. Confused. Okay. I want to know if he knows what he's looking at. I want to know if he knows what he's looking at. And what gave you the hint that he might not know what he's looking at? <laughs> Sorry, Michael. I didn't hear you. What do you say? Right. Mm. Right, because we know Mecca is more international. It's not just people from all over Saudi. It's from all over the world. What was Maxwell saying? Donald Trump. Donald Trump, so of course, yeah, he doesn't know anything about anything. <laughs> I've said that so much on the internet that he finds it. <laughs> but anyway, yes, what else? What other thoughts? Superficial. So it's like he has a superficial engagement. All right. Yes. Is it true? Is it a genuine video? How many of you think it's a real video? So nobody thinks it's a real video. Is it real? It's a real video. What could it be? What's the motive? What's the motive for faking it, or what's the motive? Uh -huh. I mean, if it if it actually happened. If it actually did happen. What was his motive? What was his? What could his motive have been? What do we know about him? Okay, he's just warming up to people. So maybe there's a motive why he's being, he's saying something nice about Muslims outside of his usual. Not so nice, right? He wants to get something else. Okay. I actually wondered who he's saying it to. When did he say it? I thought he might be actually saying it to people in the Muslim family. Well, this is ABC News, I think. So it's an American channel. And this Muir person is just an American broadcaster. So it's supposedly for an American audience, not even CNN or anything, it's not an international audience. So that's a good point. So let's go back to Cheryl's question. Might it not be real? So I'll ask this question again. How many people think this video is probably a real video of Donald Trump saying this stuff in front of that picture? Okay, so people are still thinking about that. It's actually not a real video, no. but um, usually undergraduate students very quickly ask that question. Um, not not all of them, but one of them will have that thought. And sorry, a much more digitally savvy video, right? Because they know how these things get done. Like, I'm, actually, personally, I'm a computer scientist originally. We left that field, yeah. so I know how to Photoshop a picture, but I don't know how to yeah. edit a video like that. So someone who's really, really advanced recently said, I think it might be a deep fake. Do you know what a deep fake is? Yeah. So we can fake a video, like someone talking. It's not a deep fake. It's a little bit simpler than that. It's the whole thing. It's like two or three years old. Um, when I show it to people and I don't tell them how I got the video, they usually believe me because I'm the person in front of the room. Yes, Tom? Take a guess at what the original fake Ah, the yeah. Can you guess? Is the infinity pool the place with the tower store? Which is no with a tower so? No, but no. you can I'm gonna give you a minute to search it on the internet. <laughs> um, but what happens when I tell my students that I was sent that video on WhatsApp, then it's easier for them to start saying, Oh, well, if it's sent on WhatsApp, then maybe it's not real. Um, so I'll give you a, just a minute to find out what this video is really about. Figure out what your search term is gonna be. Obviously, you guys are much more digitally literate, or at least more literate in general than my undergraduate students. <laughs> <laughs> so try to figure out what this what what is this? How do you find out if it's real or if it's not real? Obviously, if I already tell you it's fake, it's easier to search for it than if I just tell you to figure out if it's fake or not, because then you have, you have several possibilities. Found something? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Give folks a little bit of time. I'm going to check the, if I can see the chat from the virtual folks, I hope they've got time to. Oh, what's this? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Obviously, the sea of love is love for him. <laughs> now it makes sense. This is what we know of Donald Trump. <laughs> this is one of the earliest activities I show in my course. Uh, and, and why would you? Why do you think I would start with this one? I'm, I'm going to tell you obviously, but I'm just curious. Everybody hates Donald Trump. <laughs> Although somebody created that video, I don't know what they were. I don't know what the motive is for faking the video. Yeah, yeah. Why do you think I should that? To deconstruct the narrative? Sorry? That's nice. Dark caution. And critical thinking. Yeah. And one of the, excuse me, see if I can get back in there. All right. One of the things about a feminist approach is that it should challenge hierarchy and the teacher's authority, right? So I teach students when I show them something, not to accept that what I'm showing them is true from the very beginning of the semester. Then it's really, even if they are uh, suspicious when they first see it, and I think even adult audiences or students, it's kind of, they feel like it would be embarrassing for me for them to say, well, no, you know, Professor, I think this might be a fake video that you're showing us. <laughs> I don't think it's a very easy thing for them to say. And I want to let them know early on that actually you can't say that. And it does show throughout the semester that sometimes, well, actually, no, I don't like this article that you gave us, and I don't like this point of view. And that it's okay to say that, and that we can have a discussion about it. So that's one of the things. Um, and another thing is, before we start deciding that it's fake, it's not about teaching students to be suspicious and critical. It's about teaching them what do you already know that makes you suspect that there's something wrong with it. So we look at what do we know about Donald Trump, what do we know about Islam, what do we know about the Hajj, what do we know about this combination that would make us doubt it in the first place, because doubting something is contextual. Teaching students to be critical and to you know, debunk fakeness and all of that all the time would be very exhausting, it would be very difficult, and it's usually when you're biased against something, you want to disprove it, but if, if you're with something, you don't check it, right? So what are, the, what are your internal, what's your previous knowledge or internal biases, and how do they affect how you see something like this and how you respond to it? And we also talk a little bit about how different people search for things in different ways. So I heard them over here saying Trump's sea of love. If you search for that, you'll find the original ones right away. You must have searched something about fakeness or Mecca in it to show you the two next to each other so you can see that it's there. It's been found before and debunked. When I first found this video, that had not been published yet, this image of both of them next to each other. And I also talked to them about how because they're a younger generation, they know how the technology works, so they're, it's easier for them to imagine that it's fake than others. And now that they're too advanced, they're imagining the deep fake, which is way beyond them. It's just a, switching the picture again. I also tell them that I showed this video to people in New Zealand with Cheryl Brown from UCT who is now in New Zealand. And they had no reason to suspect it because they had no idea what that was in the image. There weren't any Muslims in the room at the time. And they were like, eh, no, so? Well, we don't know what that is, so we don't know why it would be suspicious, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all this knowledge that they already have. It's not knowledge that's coming from outside of them. They already have that knowledge that makes them able to question something in the first place. And when I, when I teach digital literacies, I think it's important to see, you know, people talk about, is media literacy the same thing? Is information literacy the same thing? I think there's interconnections between them. 
but they're still quite there are still areas of them that are different from each other but there's a lot to learn from them and the way digital literacy literature that i see a lot um, talks about it it doesn't always learn from everything that we already have learned in media literacy and information literacy historically um, and I, I also wanted to say some notes about the Egyptian context, which maybe South African context will be similar in the sense that it's not Western knowledge, right? Um, official news in Egypt is often in itself fake, coming out of the government or coming out of official news sources, or distorted. So you'll find the official news sources quoting different numbers for deaths in an accident, for example, or not reporting it, even though the international sources are reporting it. Or you'll find a minister of petroleum coming out and saying no increases in gas prices and the next day they increase. But that was really what he said. So it's not like it's fake realness, you know. So it's not the same as what's happening in the US. So this idea of just being skeptical of the news is quite common. Um, and it's not even authorities that have the right news. So you don't really know what to do with that. And WhatsApp and Facebook are common sources of the same information. I assume that's true here as well and probably in a lot of different places too, but really, really strong in Egypt. Uh, and obviously, Egypt is also a place where social media played an important role in our 2011 revolution. Right? Obviously, social media is, a, is, a, is the way it looks, and there's a lot happening behind that that you don't see, but, but it's also one of those countries where you can't say the social media has no potential to empower citizenship. In the country. So we have to always keep that in mind. And at the same time, that has turned into a mechanism for state surveillance. So someone can get arrested in the streets for something they wrote on Facebook or they blogged about. So that's also something like, I'm very careful about what I like on Facebook because that might make me like, I don't know what the profile is, it happens with that kind of thing. Um, and then on my own institution, the American University in Cairo, we teach in English. The students are mostly privileged because it's a private nonprofit institution, but they're often culturally hybrid. So there'll be Egyptians, who've learned in English all their lives in an American or British institution or German, that kind of thing. Some of them um, have a parent who's from somewhere else. And some of them will have Egyptian schooling, which really discourages critical thinking and questioning authority, and others will not. Um, and our institution uses American liberal arts institution, uh, education, I mean, which is sort of more about encouraging questioning and having a broad perspective about the world. And the course that I teach is part of the liberal arts curriculum. It's an option within what we call the core curriculum. So some students take it, some students don't. It's just one of the options among several. Um, and our professors are from Egypt, the US, and a mix of other countries as well. All right, so when I was doing my PhD research about critical thinking, um, I'm sure different people understand critical thinking in different ways, and in different disciplines, they apply it in different ways. But in the North American context, a lot of times they talk about critical thinking as you know, reasoning, rationality, logic, they call it informal logic and skepticism, all of which is kind of antagonistic. And so you would say, I would teach critical thinking by doing debates in the classroom, right? And what I learned while I was doing my PhD is that there's another way of looking at critical thinking, feminist approaches that some people have researched and discovered. And one of the biggest um, publications on this is a 1986 book called Women's Ways of Knowing. How many people have heard of this? Okay. So if you haven't read it, there are shorter articles about it if you want to start there. But the idea was that they researched mostly women and discovered that quite a few women were not comfortable with developing their criticality by being antagonistic. So uh, they interviewed a lot of women over time and they discovered that a lot of women like to learn by being empathic. They learn with their intuition and they connect their creativity and they want to construct knowing in more, in less antagonistic ways, in more empathetic, loving ways. And they become critical in the end, but their process to becoming critical is different. And when you teach in a classroom where you're only addressing the antagonistic way of thinking about critical thinking, you're intimidating those women into perhaps trying to mimic the way you're doing it, but they're not really convinced or they're not comfortable with it. And there are men who also feel that way. But it's, it's a lot of women do feel this way. And it, it's sort of also the, the, the more antagonistic view goes more with competition and all kinds of other philosophical approaches to education uh, that are different. And so there are others who built on this, this thinking. Um, and one of the things, you know, empathizing to learn about another before you start doubting them, uh, being comfortable with complexity and ambiguity and uncertainty, 
opening of the mind and the heart to embrace the world. So think about, for example, if you want to build a society where people work together with people who are different from themselves, when someone is different from you, you actually, you actually need to start sometimes with empathy in order to understand them rather than start by doubting them because it's much easier to doubt them. Um, and then the importance of connecting your own experience, not just external knowledge and authority, and then merging you know, the rationality and empathy part in the end, but not going just straight to the rationality part versus you know, separate knowers, what they call separate knowers, which is the more North American traditional critical thinking, which is rationality and suppresses emotion and empathy. Um, and then Thayer Bacon also builds on that about contextuality, the importance of contextuality, which I was sort of saying again at the beginning today. And then the other aspect of it is seeing not just being critical of the thing that's in front of you, but seeing the broader context within which it's, it's, it's happening. So the political power and theories about thinking in general, what's happening outside of that particular incident. And I was also influenced by critical pedagogy and the emphasis on social justice also. So it's not just being critical per se, but doing it with a social justice perspective. And in the Egyptian context, especially after 2011, and then we had another uh, ouster of the president in 2013, what I realized was happening is that people were learning to be critical at in suspecting something and saying it's not correct or being skeptical of it. But then they weren't learning to construct something together to become critical citizens. It's not enough that you go out into the streets and object to something. And I'm sure you've had incidents with similar things over here. It sounds like you're critical and it's activist, but there's no reflection going on behind it. And then once the dust settles, what are we doing to build a country together? And how are the people who are fighting now going to start constructing a new country together? That, that does not happen. And you need empathy for that. And you need to care about social justice for that so that when you're deconstructing something, you're not hurting people along the way you will, ne will never come back and be allies with you again. And I think the current global context is full of all these kinds of antagonisms that need people to get together to be able to work together on them and to become critical digital citizens because there's so much of our citizenship right now that's happening online. You still need to be a critical citizen offline, but there's so much that you can do with the digital and that's, that's why it, where it comes in with my course. Um, I can't remember where I put this quote, <laughs> but I'll move on from it. Um, and so I'm, I, what I'm doing here is I'm taking what I understand about critical thinking, going beyond the instrumental of saying, oh, this is a fallacy or this is fake, and doing the same with digital literacy. Though we, so we look at it beyond the technical of ABC, this is how I detect something is fake, into something that's about cultivating citizenship and transferring it to the digital because a lot of colonial discourses, they are, you know, about democracy and universalism and progress. They're often also the same discourses that are used with technology. So we think about technology as democratizing life, Wikipedia is democratizing, social media is democratizing. But we need to think about these things in critical ways as well. And so it's about bringing those contextual knowledge and biases knowing how knowledge is created and shared and then building empathy towards the other and then constructing their own knowledge so that's kind of where i'm coming from with my course and in a context in the american university in cairo where the majority of knowledge comes from the west in most courses in my course i try to bring knowledge from everywhere else their local knowledge knowledge from around the region um, and we don't want students to think that critique is something they follow the authorities. That's an academic thing you do and you don't do it outside the classroom. It has to come from within them as well. Um, and encouraging local knowledge and personal experience as valid and important sources of learning because they're not always documented. So they need to be able to find those and build on them, not feel like that doesn't count in academia. And then the supporting them to make connections between their personal experience and broader knowledge structures so that it's not just their personal experience on its own but connecting it to the, everything else. So some of the things I talk about in my course and the values that I try to, to do is include discussion of identities and hybridity so that they understand where they lay in the middle of all of that and how everyone else in the class is. Talk about empathy and bias. There's a missing in equity culture and language. We talk about those things. I don't think you can talk about digital literacies and do intercultural learning if you haven't discussed issues of equity and social justice properly. And language is a big part of that as well. 
because then when you come to look at digital literacies, you need to see the connections between how data and digital platforms and algorithms, how they influence how we get information right now. So it's different than information literacy and media literacy in those senses of what the platforms are doing to influence what we see. Uh, very important for me to bring authors like Arab authors, African authors, Asian authors, not just Western authors. So they learn from these things from our perspective. So for example, when Zainab Tufekli, who is a Turkish American, talks about social media from the Turkish perspective, it resonates a lot more with us in Egypt than when I hear Americans talk about it. Their perspective is very different. The kind of government they have is very different. And one of the really important things for me is that students contribute material to the course. So I come with my own material, but I have parts of my course where I encourage students to bring their own material to for example, uh, digital research Egyptians. That was one of my uh, assignments this semester. You bring Egyptian examples of digital literacy and display them to the rest of the class and we all learn. There's no way, you know, if I have 20 students at 25 this semester, I don't know all 25 of the people that they brought forward. So this was adding knowledge that I can then use in future semesters for students to look at. Because what it will look like will be different than how it looks like in the West where everybody knows what everyone's doing there. And in the class, dialogue as pedagogy and intercultural learning outside of class with people from different countries. And the, the dialogue is not debate, right? And that's really important for students to know that it's safe to say different perspectives and to listen to each other rather than to try to win an argument, which is really important for listening as well. And narrating process. So when I'm doing something in the class, like trying to debunk fake news, it's not about what you discovered, but how you went through that process. And sometimes I'll bring something into the class or I'll invite them to bring something they think might be fake and we go through the process of discovering it together so that they can see that. It's not like that process that I already have down pat and it's done, but we go through it. So when they see that process, then they can see how something can go wrong, that I'm not perfect, that they, they get to experience the process, that different people do it differently and that, that we're learning from each other's processes. It's very important for me to discuss intersectionality, like the different dimensions of where they might have power and where they might not. We do role play, so they put them themselves in someone else's position and try to, to live through that. And they play uh, digital narrative games, you know, choose your own adventure games for the digital, for promoting empathy, and they develop their own. Have, has any of you played one of those before? Can you think of one? Yeah, Thomas, which one? Do you have in mind? Do you remember what it's called? So there are lots of them. There are two that we that were required to do. One is the Syrian journey. So you put yourself in the place of a Syrian refugee trying to go somewhere safe. That's a very short game, and then people start to say, some people feel it a lot, and some people say it superficializes the experience. Um, but others learn a lot because they hadn't thought about all that. You know, they think, oh, you just travel and you get there. You know? Um, and there's one about being poor, and most of my students have never been poor. And going through in the U.S., it's being poor in the U.S. and making sort of decisions of what you might spend money on, what you might skip doing, and things like that. And then they play a lot of others. There's ones about depression. There's ones about all kinds of things. And they develop their own, so they've developed games on... Um, being illiterate. They develop games about drunk driving, and they develop games about addiction. And they do research and create their own games to help promote empathy of others. And they're doing them digitally. So they're using their digital literacy to, to, to solicit emotion from others. So, and some of the challenges that I face in this course, and I don't know, does anybody here teach digital literacy or something similar to that? No. Does anybody have digital literacy infused in your courses? Or? Yes. <laughs> okay. And so the academics who infuse digital literacy in their courses are in different disciplines, right? And I think maybe what is important about digital literacy, I think it has different dimensions and in each current each Subject matter, it might have a different um, thing that they would focus on. In my class, I have diverse student backgrounds. So some of my students are in the sciences and some of them are in social sciences. So sometimes I have a student who's a computer scientist and they assume because they study computer science that they're digitally literate. 
but they haven't thought critically about it. Right? They, they do it and they do coding, but they don't do the other things. And I have students who have a social science background where they're comfortable with the critical question, maybe a little bit more, but not so much with doing it with technology. So it, they learn a lot from each other in that way. And I also have different levels of digital literacy, obviously. Some of them are much more um, savvy with the technology and have thought about it, and some of them are not so savvy. But the important thing is most of them have not really thought about it in the ways that we're doing So even if they know how to use the technology, they haven't necessarily thought critically about what's the picture they put up on their Twitter profile and why would you use that picture, for example. Um, and I also have students from different schooling backgrounds and those affect how much they're willing to question authority and how critical they are in the first place. So I have to deal with those differences and try to make sure everyone um, gets to, you know, a certain minimum of, of getting there. And the other thing is, and I'm sure most of you know, like if you try to have dialogue in a classroom, that doesn't mean that there will be equal power in that room. There are still people who might dominate the conversation. There are still people who, when you allow every perspective to come in, that might say things that are affect, offensive to others. And I've had a, a, quite a few male students who sometimes say really offensive things about race or about gender. And uh, it's, it's, it's one of the tricky things to deal with that. Thankfully, I usually have enough um, very loud female students who respond to them. <laughs> because if I have to, of course, I have more power in the classroom and that could silence a lot of other people. Um, and and I, I often have students who seem to be sensitive otherwise, but there are one or two things where they don't realize they're being sensitive and politically correct. And it's, it's sometimes helpful because they're being honest about something that they really feel. But it's also sometimes very difficult because it will suppress the other students. So it's a very difficult balance to bring up difficult topics. And it's sometimes easier to talk about race in the United States where it's not about them and they're comfortable talking about it. when it comes to discrimination in Egypt, it becomes much more sensitive. And some of them get really, really upset and, and then we have to sort of work with that. But I think it's important to, to you know, put the, reflect the light back on ourselves and not just to talk about these things in the generic way. Um, a few students get really upset with the messy exploration process and uh, they, they want to know what the right answer was and they get confused by getting to see all the details. This uh, looks like several people are nodding, so this sounds like it's familiar to some of you. And the other thing is it's just different from how other academics are teaching. So I don't know if maybe sometimes what I'm teaching them is not something that will be, I hope it's going to be useful to them in their lives, but I'm not really sure how useful it's going to be, you know, when they, um, when they go on to another course. Um, so I, I want to invite you guys to try something. So I try in my class to talk about these equity and ethical issues first, and then I start doing some digital literacy stuff. And one of the things I want to teach them about is artificial intelligence and how it works. Has anyone tried Google's Quick Draw before? Okay, so just Google it. <laughs> it's actually, so I think it's quickdraw.google.com, and try it for once. It's, it's gonna, it's a doodling software, so virtual folks, you can try it as well. It's a doodling software. It's Google trying to learn how humans doodle so that when you draw something really fast, it's going to try to figure out what it is, but it's actually telling you what it wants you to draw each time and then letting you know if you got it correct or not. And if you get it right, it shows it to you. I can actually play one here because I see some people don't have devices, so I can actually play it right now on the screen so folks can see it. So it's very difficult to draw on a laptop. It's easier on a phone. And you have a very limited time to do it. So if you don't have a device and someone next to you has a device, maybe you want to look with them. This is very slow. Maybe it's slow because of the Zoom. What do you think, Jacob? Is it slow because of the Zoom? Yeah. It's gotten really clever with the uh, with the way it responds to you. It's very slow here. Okay. This is one of the things where if I start a class with them, 
intelligence that is based on neural networks that learns from the data it gets is that it becomes biased like the data it's getting right whatever it learns from that's what it knows and so and I want to teach them this about artificial intelligence in general which is like Google search it's like plagiarism detection thing it's like any machine learning thing and that it has cultural dominance right so quick draw is a good example of that so for example now there's different languages I don't know if you noticed you can do it in different languages one of them is Arabic, and this is a picture supposedly of an angel, okay? Most Arabic-speaking people are Muslim, and in Islam, you don't represent angels in any visual form. So there is no reason why a Muslim person who's not exposed to Western culture would draw an angel like that. So clearly, it's taking the data from everywhere and using it in all the different languages. It shouldn't probably do that. There's, there's one where there's a baseball bat, I think, or it says bat, and you think about the flies, but it could be a baseball bat. There's nail, so that could be a nail, or it could be a nail, right? Uh, but then there's some like hospital, right? And the hospital expects to see a cross. And obviously, in Egypt, we don't put a cross, we put a crescent. That's not there. Um, so there are things like that, that it's, it's just expecting you to draw, you know, um, camouflage. What do you think when you hear the word camouflage? Army? I didn't know that one. I know camouflage as in a butterfly on a flower and you can't see it. <laughs> so I was like, how do I draw that? And yeah, but they're looking for army camouflage. I didn't know that's what it was called in the first place. Um, so one of the things I discovered, for example, is the stop sign. And you're expected to write stop in English, even when you're doing the Arabic version. <laughs> right? <laughs> That is weird. So I thought it was a, it's a, it's a fun game to play. It's nice to see the AI happening while you're doing it. It's nice to see how it responds to you. It's nice to see how other people do the same thing you're doing, but it's, you also get to see how the bias becomes built in because of the data that it's getting, knowing that you are from the minority of kind of data that giving it to you. So, and, and that kind of thing, you know, then trying to discuss it, but with more important context, but they can see it in a very small activity. 
after they've studied empathy bias, equity, and so on. And so I'm going to stop here. I feel like I've talked so much. And <laughs> It's been very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm here to take questions. I don't know if Yakov is watching the virtual if they have questions, but I'll do can I just take them? <laughs> I would like to sit closer to the camera will see. So, and the uh, audio will not be Have any comments or questions? Yes. What things do you do to try and help make students feel more at home with an unusual teaching style? Mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, how do you get them to quickly cope with teaching in a different way? That's a very good question. So one of the first things is just to be explicit about why I do what I do. One of the things I try to do in my classes, for example, let them assess themselves and decide what grade they deserve. And that drives some of them crazy and some of them feel like it's very empowering. And so I've, I've learned to get them to talk about it with me a lot more about what they're uncomfortable with as well and get their views on how they felt doing it as we do it and things like that. So that's one of the things I do. The other one is just very early on, I showed them a video by Shari Felix um, about what an inclusive environment could look like. It's about how to exclude someone. And it's about how certain things will make some people feel comfortable and some people not. I asked them all to, um, to bring out a paper and write their name with their left hand. And I say whether or not you're left-handed, write it with your left hand. And to remind them that for some people, things will be very easy, so left-handed will be easy. If you're not, it's going to be harder, but over time, people get used to that kind of thing. So, but it's okay to feel uncomfortable a little bit at the beginning. But what I, what I tend to experience is that there's usually a few students who are comfortable with it early on, and others take time. And the ones who take time sometimes are more comfortable writing on their blogs how they're feeling about things and what their thoughts are than talking about it in class. And then what I do with them is that I uh, bring what they've said into class. So that they know that they're thinking this value well, and without having to put them on the spot and asking them to say it themselves. And that seems to work. Um, when certain situations happen where there's conflict in the classroom, I talk to individuals outside of class. We have um, we have a, I use Slack with the students outside of class time and they can send me private messages. And for some people this works really well. For others, I ask them to come to my uh, office. So it depends, different people, different things work for different people. Um, there's also a lot of small group activities, so that when they're not comfortable with the large group discussion, they're usually okay with having a, a talking with two or three other people and doing those discussions with someone maybe that already sits next to them and they're comfortable with before we move on to something like um, I've written a collaborative autoethnography with four of my students, and then I learned from that as well. Obviously, those four are the ones who agreed to write it with me, so they already liked the course. And, they're studious enough to want to write an academic, you know, book chapter. But I also learned from interrogating a little bit more about them. So, for example, um, one of my students was half Palestinian. Mm -hmm. And in Egypt, even though we support Palestine in all the overt ways, there's a lot of underlying tension. Mm -hmm. And so it was about, you know, whether she would reveal that dimension of her identity or not, and how she would what would make her feel comfortable to say that? And students have told me later, this is what made me feel comfortable, this is what made me not say that. I think every time you have a different student body, there will be different things. I was just keeping an eye out for each one, honestly. There isn't like one thing that I do that I think is comfortable for everyone. I don't know if that helps. It's almost time, so folks need to leave, that's fine. On my campus, we have one to two. There are no classes for anyone. <laughs> I imagine this is not a thing that can be done in five minutes. Um, but do you explain how or discuss how you uh, model or use an empathic mode for a critical, like a specific critical discussion instance or event? Um, okay, so I forgot to mention this, but equity and bounds. Is an open curriculum that I created with Captain Conan and Mia Zamora. That's fully available online. Uh, like you can see the different themes that 
I do in my class, and then they use parts of it in their classes. Um, and it, it's got the list of materials that I would use in my class to introduce the ideas of empathy and bias. There are a few, though, that are offline, like the things we do in the classroom. So there, there is a particular video by Bina Candola, who's a professor at Oxford, where he talks about diffusing bias. And we discuss that video, and we play those games. And then we do sort of role plays about equity that also help you with empathy. And those things seem to help a lot. So in the chapter, in the book chapter, which I think some of you I describe some of these activities a little bit more, and the students describe how they felt doing them. Um, so I can send you that. And there was actually, I'm trying to remember who from South Africa. There's a, there's a particular activity we do, which is called, the, I call it the modified privilege walk. The privilege walk is quite famous where people pretend they're someone else and they take steps forward or back depending on whether they have privilege. But the way I do it in my class, they're not representing themselves. They, we talk about inequity in different categories and they make up their own categories of, for example, socioeconomic class and like gender and, the, and you know, sexuality and all the differences in identities and they make up their own scenarios and then randomly they get three identity cards this is what they know about themselves so they know that they're like christian um, homosexual female for example and then nobody knows who everyone else is and we do the walk where do you have a car do you have uh, religious freedom can you stand forward and back that activity seems to work really really well it's very short you can do it in one class and you reflect on it later um, and, and these are categories that they created, and so they reflect back on them. That's one of the activities that works really well. And it's, it's a bit difficult to describe, but I think I described it okay. Yes. But there was someone, I think, from I think South Africa, who suggested to me on Twitter that one of the other things you can do when you're doing this activity and reflecting on it is also to reflect on, first of all, would it be different in a different context? So, for example, Christians in Egypt are a minority, but in most other parts of the world they're not. So if they had the same card, but they were located somewhere else, these things would be different. Um, and also, one of my friends suggested that maybe we should say, well, how can we redress you know, this inequality and inequity? What can we do with that? But that, for some reason, that moment of role play is very short. You think it wouldn't have an impact, but they really feel it. Like they feel like they're behind and everybody else is in front of them. And, and they it physically makes them feel something. Yes. 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 So, right. So, in the liberal arts curriculum at my institution, we have uh, so you have your major courses, your engineer or your history your major or whatever. So you do those, and then there's a set of courses that. Everyone has to take, and there are a set of courses you have to take something along those lines. So mine is a what's called a global studies requirement. So they have to take a course in global studies. It could be a comparative religion course, could be a world history course. Mine is called uh, digital literacy and intercultural learning. So they they have an intercultural learning experience where they talk to other students through something called Solia. This is an activity that already exists. I'll talk about it tomorrow. <laughs> That uh, it's, it's an organization, it's a nonprofit organization that connects students from all over the world in intercultural dialogue. And if you get into that dialogue without thinking about equity and empathy and bias issues, it can be a really bad experience. <laughs> and you don't think about it very critically. You think, oh, hi, you just get to know someone, what do you eat in your country? And that's it. Um, so so that, that, and then I added the digital literacy component to it because I felt like, you know, to have digital literacy when you're dealing with others digitally, right? Yeah. So. That's where that comes from. So it's a global studies requirement. Um, there are other types of requirements. If that's the one that I... Yeah, I know your global citizenship program is on the side in a few weeks. I know obviously only people who are interested would take it. In my class, a lot of people come in by coincidence because of the scheduling <laughs> worked out for them. But yeah, but also it's it's a course that only I teach. So one of the things I would love, love to have is like a course that other people can teach as well. But it's also very difficult when you design it because it's based on your personality and your connections <laughs> and all of that. But, yeah. Yes. <coughs> um, just a just a quick one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what would be your advice to universities and institutions um, which are faced with demand? 
Yeah. Yeah. So one of the first things I was thinking about is you don't use that discourse of decolonizing in Egypt in the way that it's very strong here in South Africa. I learned this from my South African friends. Right? Um, and and one of the things for me, the, the main thing I would say is participation of the people. I think if, if I try to decolonize from my perspective, my privileged perspective, then I'm not really decolonizing. It's about bringing in the folks. From not, not just the ones who are currently academics, because a lot of times they're not in that position. And bringing people and asking them to both decide the, not just the content, but also the processes that work well for that culture. And trying to bring in that from there. So I'll tell you an example of something that I do uh, when I used to teach um, ethics and educational technology, for example, to Egyptian teachers who have never heard of things like plagiarism and copyright and so on. And I, I want to teach them about it. Instead of telling them, well, this is what the Americans told us and we have to follow it, that, that's where we are at the American University in Cairo. I say, the majority of them are Muslim, and I say, what's the Islamic way of, of, um, of saying that the hadith is credible? And how do you do that? You check your sources, you check who said what, you check the credibility of the person, and, and if you don't say who it is, then it's a problem, and if you don't quote it properly, you have to say that it's you're paraphrasing it, and if you're quoting the Quran, you have to say which page number, no, well, not which page number, which particular verse, and how these things matter. So that it's something that comes from their culture. So it's not something that's coming from the West that they're teaching us how to do, and we know nothing about it. But to see where does it, where does this principle or those values exist, and then build from the values of people from that culture. Um, and it's easy in this case because this is my culture, but if it wasn't, if I was an American professor coming into AUC, then I would need to, to get other folks to, to, to help me design that. And I wouldn't assume that I would know. I would have to actually bring them in to, to help me do that. Um, and, and sometimes if you, you know, with, with um, younger students, there's something called culturally relevant pedagogy that started in the US coming out of race theory. And what they will do is they'll bring the students to bring in the content because maybe they don't have colleagues who are teaching who have that knowledge and be able to do it. And then if the students are too young, bring their parents. You know, so it's that process of where do you get the knowledge from? Just get it from those different places, from the experiences of people. That's that's how it looks like in my context. But in, in South Africa, maybe when you say decolonizing, you're thinking of completely different things. So do let me know if I've got this completely wrong, if I'm answering this completely wrong. Okay, I know it's time. So if people have to leave, they can leave. If they want to stay, I'm, I'm staying for a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you.